Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran who refuses to use auto-tune in the studio, or else a scrappy upstart who refuses to listen to their own voice in playback unless it has been processed by like a dozen plugins, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the first Friday of October 2021, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Lander, (laughs) who drove a Mitsubishi Outlander with an Avenged Sevenfold bumper sticker and who is always trying to sell you shots of Southern Comfort that he had portioned into Dasani bottles. And old Lander would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on YouTube for Sunday songs. That's a live stream, man. I'm live. I'm playing tunes. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I think that we're building something of a community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who listen to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Head over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug or go to JoePugMusic.com and click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, You could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name. Then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay because you dig the show and you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month, if just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who has already taken the time and energy to do that. I really appreciate you. Uh, If you're not in a position to contribute in that way, I totally get it. You could still help out the show for free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show, spread the word about the show, The simple math on those two last things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. This week's episode is a little bit different than a normal week, and that's because our guest, Rhett Miller, has a podcast of his own called Wheels Off. And uh, this interview, it starts out actually with him interviewing me for his interview, and then in the middle of it, after our interlude, it switches to me interviewing him. I've decided to just air the whole thing in its entirety because it holds together like a like a single conversation, basically. But all this is to say, I talk a little bit more in this episode than you might be used to me uh, in regular episodes. And I, I try very hard 
on these episodes to let it be about the guests and not about myself. Um, but there's obviously special circumstances this time around. That's why you're going to hear me yap a little bit more in this episode. So thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. And I hope that you dig this interview with Rhett. Our guest this week hails from Highland Park, Texas, and is now in his fourth decade of releasing critically acclaimed Roots music. Rhett Miller is the lead singer of the old 97s and is also an accomplished solo artist in his own right. He's recorded for Elektra, Verve Forecast, and ATO Records. Music isn't the only medium that he excels in. Miller has written articles and essays that have been published in Rolling Stone, Mick Sweeney's, The Atlantic, Sports Illustrated, and Salon. And his podcast, Wheels Off, has hosted the likes of Roseanne Cash, Liz Fair, Tig Notaro, and many others. He's toured with Emmylou Harris, Tori Amos, Steve Earle, and many more. American Songwriter has called him prolific. Rolling Stone has said of his lyrics that he has a knack for perfectly turned lines. Pitchfork has described his music as impeccably crafted and heavy on tasteful tune smithery. Rhett and I got on the phone a few weeks ago to talk about our respective journeys so far. Welcome to Wheels Off, Joe Pug. It is so great to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Rhett, thank you. Thanks for having me on. This is so cool. And uh, for the edification of our listeners, from where are you joining us? I'm joining you from a water damaged basement in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is where I make my home and uh, where I record everything that I do. This is my studio. God, I'm so sorry about the water damage. How bad was it? Oh, it was years ago. It was years ago. But uh, (laughs) I thought it was Ida. (laughs) No, thank God. Thank God. Um, It looks great. Um, Our podcast listeners won't be able to see it, but the room you're in has tons of cool stuff and books and musical instruments. And it looks like you've settled in, made it a creative space. I have. I think it's important to have a a space, a physical space to create things. And I didn't have one for years. And I'm actually really surprised about the difference that it makes. Um, well, this is so cool, man. I, I, w- so what are you working on right now and how does it light you up? Man, I do a couple of things. I do, um, obviously my main thing is I, I write music. I'm a songwriter first and foremost. Uh, so, um, I'm finishing up a record right now. Uh, so I just finished that. That just went to mastering this week. God, that's so exciting. Did you bring in a full band? Well, in the COVID times, the way it worked is I virtually brought in uh, a band. So everyone was bouncing me their parts. And um, I've gotten pretty nifty at uh, audio editing at this point. So I kind of edited the arrangements into where they had to be. uh, And then I sent it off for mix and master. Golly. So have you always been so tech savvy? Because when I think of you, I think of like a troubadour with a, you know, a piece of wood with strings strung on it and making noise with no plug in anything. But it seems like you've figured out the interface in the digital age. I have, man. You know, about six or seven years ago, I read a book called The Medium is the Message by yeah, Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I love it. And um, he, you know, just as the title might suggest, he really emphasizes in that book Um, how important he might even say that it's the prime part of importance, but how important the medium is for, for getting across your, um, your message as an artist. And so from there, I really started taking seriously, um, the medium, the lens through which I would be creating music and the lens through which people would be consuming it. Um, and so that made me start taking, uh, recording really seriously. So it started, you know, home recording and now it's, it's turned into something, uh, more serious. I produced my last record and mixed it. And this one I produced, um, I, I reached a point in the process where I realized I wouldn't be able to mix it. You know, mixing a full band is kind of a different thing, but yeah, I've gotten pretty, I've invested a lot of time in, in the recording process. 
That's so funny. I, I, I loved that book and was obsessed with it. And um, there's so many things that it um, sort of predicted, like the global village, right? Um, but whenever I, whenever I thought of the medium as the message, I thought uh, the song, like the, you know, the, the way that you're delivering something. I didn't think about like the literal physical delivery system by which you're handing them the thing. That's, that's brilliant. I, maybe I was just being lazy. Well, I think there's several mediums there. And I think the song would be one of them. People are going to experience a song a lot different than they experience an op-ed in the New York Times or, um, you know, a lecture from their parents. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, I think that you're looking at how it's recorded. That's another medium. And then beyond that, we can go even beyond that and and say, you know, it used to be people were buying CDs at Tower Records and you would listen to an album in a certain way. And now the new model uh, and medium is obviously streaming. So it's Spotify. Um, people are consuming that in a different way. So I think artists, and rightfully so, are are maybe augmenting how they make their works of art so that it can shine through both in the medium. Think about this. It goes even deeper, Rhett, like the medium of Spotify, but then also how important it is for your album to sound good on Apple earbuds going into mm -hmm. people's ears. Like you, you have to, that has to be one of your references and mixed to that. So I think there's a lot of different mediums going on and you always have to, as an artist, um, you, you should be cognizant of all those things. It's so funny you say that. I find my teenagers a lot now will turn music on and just set down their phone. So it's the tiny speaker at the butt of an <gasps> iPhone that's making all the sound. <laughs> you know, that's that's brutal. But I have to admit, when we have a party at our house, I, I do the same thing. I just turn <laughs> it on. You know, sometimes I'll put it in a bowl so it's yeah. a little louder. But, you know... <laughs> And so, you know, it's, it's got to sound good in a mix. And you know what sounds damn good like that still? Recordings from the 50s and 60s. If you put on a Chuck Berry record just on your iPhone, just like that, it sounds great. Because they were used to mono. They were used to speakers that didn't sound great. So they had to record and mix in a very broad way, very not detailed way. Um, and so his recordings still sound great when you're playing them through little iPhone speakers. Boy, I still think about those old uh, recordings where they would just put one microphone and they'd all have to find the right distance. And then they'd have to get a take where nobody screws up the take. Yep. Yeah, I know. I mean, wow. that's a totally different medium right there. That's going to change who is able to play on your record. Maybe you have to hire musicians then who uh, maybe don't have as high of a ceiling uh, virtuoso wise, but they can hit the take every time. And, you know, as we move on and recording becomes digital and, and more malleable, then you can have guys and gals who have higher ceilings of, you know, virtuosity, but who might screw up a bunch of times. I mean, the medium, this this conversation just can go. There's so many layers to it. it it's an onion, to be sure. Mm. Um, so when you were a little Joe starting out, do you remember? Um, because obviously you've had, you know, some um, you've had different chapters in your career like it's funny listening to you talk about right now the the prowess that you've developed with um well you didn't call it prowess i'm calling it prowess <laughs> with um you know, with the technology uh that you use to make the music the the um the incredible work you've done in in sort of you know the the thing that i've been trying to do re more recently with um you know inner interviews um conversations about creativity and the process uh, which is fascinating and noble, I think, um, you know, to just the, the the troubadour work you've done. Do you remember when you were starting out, do you remember having a clear vision as a really young person about what you wanted to do? And was it music? Was there some epiphany? Did you have a vision of this? Yeah, I'd say so. I think I've always wanted to just be in front of people and communicating with people. Um, my grandfather uh, my dad's dad was um, the head of the theater department at the University of Maryland, where, and we grew up very close to there. He was an interesting guy. Um, and he got me into performing uh, a lot when I was a kid, and uh, he directed one little theater troupe that I had when I was six or seven years old. And he told me later that we rehearsed for months and months and months to do this little performance, and that as soon as I got in front of an audience, though, I basically just dropped the whole script and started, you know, pandering. <laughs> Uh, to the audience. And, uh, you know, that's, that's always been, hopefully I pander a little bit less, but um, that has always been a, a sort of drug for me. That's always been a pull for me to go and, uh, and kind of communicate with an audience. So in high school, I did theater. 
Um, and then uh, once I got to college, I rediscovered music, which I had played when I was a kid. And, uh, and then in my 20s, things just kind of took off for me. And, and that's here I am now continuing to play music. But I, I think it was always going to be some some iteration of of me communicating with people. You studied um, like playwriting at some point, right? I did. Yeah, I went to college at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill to study playwriting. Um, it was a really cool program down there. The whole reason I chose it is because they they kind of focused on students writing plays and then mounting them, fully mounting them. So I got to mount uh, a few plays down there at North Carolina. Wow. And were you already were doing music, but were you already writing songs at that time? Were they competing for your heart? Those media? No, no, they weren't. But you know, I when I left college, the problem with theater is it takes a lot of people to mount a production and it takes a lot of money and it takes a physical space. And as you know, I mean with music, man, you just need a seventy-five dollar guitar and you're good to go. You can write the songs in your room. There's always an open mic night to go to if you're not growing up in COVID times. Um, now there's always the opportunity to to publish your music basically for free to the whole world. Not that anybody will listen to it, but it's still pretty cool that you can publish it, you know? <laughs> so to me, I, I think I, the reason I ended up going the music route is it was just kind of like a, I mean, I, I love music, obviously, but it, it's also just a fact of it, it was very... It was completely accessible. I, I could start like today. Um, you, you ever hear that that thing? There's a, an anecdote about uh, Richard Pryor. He was meeting with a new manager of his, and the manager sat him down for like three hours and explained this whole way over the next five years that they were going to take over the world and and uh, things were going to be great. And the manager stopped talking, and apparently Richard Pryor just said, that sounds great. What are we going to do tomorrow? And that's kind of the way I felt about music. It's like, well, I want to communicate with people. Theater, it's going to take a long time to do that. It, you know, music, I can start today. I can start tomorrow and, and kind of linearly move forward with it for better or for worse. God, it's funny. I, I, I have a 17-year-old son now who's super into uh, Eckhart Tolle and the power of now and like a pretty spiritual kid. And he uh, he's really reminding me of the thing that, that I think I used to think about a lot, which is what you're saying, right? Like the, the future is an idea that just floats out there, but really now is, is all we have. I love Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, so it's funny. Okay. So as you're talking about the, uh, the necessity of other people, I'm reminded of the Sartre quote, you know, hell is l'enfer, c'est les autres. The hell is other people. Right. And um and I, you know, I've I've encountered that as well, right? It's it's so nice to be self reliant, um, but I but I do know that you've um, over the years uh, been able to collaborate with people pretty well, and I that's just such a big part of music. And and I, I mean, I wonder what your experience was, how you made peace with it, how you found like a way to work with other people where you didn't feel dependent on them or hindered by them. Well. It's still not something that I'm great with, uh, <laughs> to be completely honest with you, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, somewhere along the way, I don't know. I, it was probably when I became a parent four or five years ago, but somewhere along the way, um, I do feel like I got better at uh, not having to be the person in a room when something creative is happening that is only pulling for my own ideas for the sole virtue that they are my own ideas. Uh, you know what I mean? And I, I think I've gotten better at tending to pull for ideas um, that kind of win the day of the marketplace of ideas of all the artists uh, coming together. Not saying I do that all the time, but I've definitely gotten better. And that, um, it happened to go with hand in hand with becoming a parent. So I suspect it had a little something to do with uh, developing a better sense of humility. Oh, that's so funny. Which, which being a parent, as you know, Will, uh, oh. that'll, come in, that'll come and smack you in the chops really quick. <laughs> <laughs> just wait until they're teenagers and they can roast you all no, day, no, no. every day. Uh, th have you done a lot of like co-writing? Is that, is that something that you've spent time doing? I, I I've tried. I last year during the pandemic, I, I tried to start doing it. Um, Cause I just thought to myself, I mean, for all the years that I've been in the music business, I never went down the, the route of, you know, a publishing deal or, or trying to get songs on, film and television. So, 
you know, every songwriter at some point thinks to themselves, like, I should have a bunch of songs on TV, man, and just sit, sit home and collect money. <laughs> um, so I tried to start doing that a little bit uh, last year. I'm not, I'm not great. I had a really good um, collaborative process with an album I made a few years ago with uh, Kenneth Pattengale from the Milk Carton Kids. He produced the album for me, and he, um, he co-wrote a bunch of the songs or helped me edit a bunch of the songs. That went well, though, simply because he was so excellent at, at that process, and I learned a lot from him. But uh, 90% of the success of our collaboration there had to do with his deftness of, uh, of working with other people. Is that something you think that you, have you done that much or do you think you'll end up doing that producing? I don't know. I don't know how you feel about this, man, but I'm in a place where I, I just don't feel like I have time uh, to do that. Or, or maybe it's that I don't have interest because when we have interest in things, we make time for it. Right. Yeah. You know? And so up until now, I guess now that I'm responding to your question, it's, it's making me be a little bit more honest with myself. Up until now, I've always said, well, I don't have time to take on other projects like that. But if I was really interested in bringing other people's music to life and it was something that I found invigorating creatively, I'd probably make time for it. So, um, yeah, I, I guess maybe the answer is no. I'm, I'm just interested in <laughs> making records of my own to the degree that I can. I talked to... Um... Harlan Coben, the the mystery writer or thriller writer, and he described um, a famous mystery writer who was a single mother of three kids and had a full time job, and um, and she would wake up at five a.m. every day and write from five until six thirty, and then get the kids off to school, go to work, get the kids home, go to bed, and um, and that was his thing. He's like, "Don't tell me you don't have time to write," you know. So. I, I felt appropriately shamed <laughs> and also, oh, man. Um, also inspired, but that, yeah. yeah, I think that was his point too. If you want to do it, you'll do it. But I feel like I'm, I'm like you, it's, it's hell is other people. I don't know that I want to produce somebody else. I have hard enough time producing my own world. And, and I mean, it just takes so much time um, to make um, a great or even approaching great album. Um, so to, uh, to invest that time in someone else's work, um, you, you would have to have a completely different conception of yourself as an artist. You know what I mean? Um, and I just don't know that I have that. Maybe, maybe when I get older, uh, I will. Um, I could see maybe, I don't know how you would feel about this, but I could see hitting a period of like, not exactly writer's block, but a place where I'm not writing as many songs, but still fe feeling like, well, I've developed all these skills, you know, the Liam Neeson from Taken, I have a certain set of skills uh, that I can use on this project. Uh, so maybe if I wasn't uh, producing my own songs at a clip, I, I'd feel inspired to go use those other skills um, on a record. Uh, but not yet. I'm, I'm still digging writing. Um, you've done so much. I mean, you've put so many hours now into talking to songwriters about their process and their work. Um, it's funny, but, you know, for someone that's not like actively seeking co-writes or seeking, you know, production, uh, what is it that drives you to, to have those conversations? Well, it started, uh, out of some pretty cynical reasons and it's, it's, uh, it's developed into something much, I won't say pure, but, um, something much more edifying, uh, I started a podcast six years ago because I noticed something that maybe a lot of other singer songwriters have noticed, which is every time you put out an album, it's really hard to get other people to listen to it. There's a million albums coming out uh, all the time. Uh, so I thought to myself, well, I'm kind of interested in doing this podcast where I talk to other people and cynically I could use it as my Trojan horse to get people to listen to, to my music. Um, so that was kind of, uh, the reason there, there was a good reason for doing it, but also I had some kind of brass tax reasons for doing it. Uh, and it does remain that for me. It, it is on a brass tax level, very helpful for me to cultivate um, an audience by, by doing these conversations. But the edifying part of it that has really come out of it for me is the, we have a very small community of people that do this for a living that are guys or gals who, um, 
write songs, have cultivated uh, an audience, and can make their living going out communicating with that audience, trying to make beautiful things for that audience, and effectively you know, give them to them <laughs> in exchange for a way to pay your mortgage. So there's a very small group of us that did this. I remember at one time I was on, I went to go see Todd Snyder play a show. Hmm. Uh, I was passing through Salt Lake City. He happened to be playing that night. I went to go see the show, and I was hanging on the bus with him afterwards, and he, out of nowhere, he said, Joe, how many people you think are in this little club? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, how many people are in this little club where we get to just make stuff up? We make beautiful things for people who listen to us and it, you know, it pays our bills. I said, I don't know, Todd. And, and I thought that he was just kind of rhetorically making this flourish, but he wasn't at all. He, he started then trying to estimate. He was like, do you think it's <laughs> a thousand people? Do you, think it, do you think it's 750? Do you think it's 500? But the point of the matter was whatever the number was, it it wasn't a million and it wasn't a hundred thousand. It wasn't 50. It probably wasn't 10,000. So it, it's this very small group of people that do this type of work. Um, and therefore it should be a tight knit community. And, but it never felt like that to me until I started doing the podcast, until I started reaching out to people. And I've found that, um, people in our community are like just dying to talk about this type of stuff. They're dying to talk with one another. They're dying to have some sort of connection with one another that isn't just like shadow visiting someone else's page to see how many followers they have and then <laughs> beating yourself up in the dark that you don't have that many or whatever. Like, you know, we want to root for each other. We want to exchange, you know, proprietary, you know, trade secrets to one another to help one another. And uh, that's what it's turned into. Um, for me. And, and it's really cool. Now when I go to a festival, in pre-COVID times at least, uh, when I go to a festival, or I'm around a lot of other songwriters, uh, people just come up to me, e even if they don't know me, they'll come up to me and they feel like they know me because this medium of podcasting is so intimate. And um, I love that. I, I, love, um, I love people feeling like they know me. I love people just opening up conversations like that and just kind of getting to the chase. And I love kind of being um, at the center of this very small community, whatever it is, like, like Todd said, whether it's a thousand, 1500, 2000 people, whatever. I, I love being in the mix with, with all those people. And it's so, uh, you, you made me think of the, the old axiom that comparison is the thief of joy, uh, which, which, you know, shadow visiting someone's page and, and being envious of their follower number um, is the perfect example of these days. But it's sweet. It's almost like you've taken that and flipped it on, on its head. Like we can come together and we can compare, but we're comparing notes and experiences and we're learning from each other and, and helping each other. Yes. Yes. And so, so like my two closest friends in music are BJ Barham of American Aquarium and Tim Showalter from Strand of Oaks. And those are always the conversations that we had together privately on the phone of just like, dude, how did you do this? I really screwed up this. I need some help here. Who's your supplier for this? Um, I'm not selling any freaking tickets because uh, of in, in this market because of this. And it's, um, it's really kind of open and vulnerable between us. I don't think it's that vulnerable on the podcast. That's a little bit more of a public forum, but it, it was trying to get to that sort of um, uh, that tr sort of friendship where a, it's a genuine friendship where people are rooting for the best part of the other person to come out, you know? Yeah. Even though you're not bandmates, like you're not part of the same um, crew that's selling the same exact item. But I love that you are really actively embodying the idea that the rising tide lifts all ships. That's great. Yes. Or, or, or maybe even, maybe even, uh, you know, Tim or BJ in this case, maybe even them succeeding in some way, doesn't lead to anything for me materially successful or, you know, maybe is, there is no rising tide for me. And, and even then, even then still willing the best for that other person, simply because you love them, you love their family. You think it's a good thing. You love their music. So you think it's a good thing for their music to propagate as much as possible. That'd be a good thing for our community and for our country, for more people to listen to like those songs. So, um, I'm not saying that I always uh, uh, feel that way. And maybe some of it is more cynical and I, I am hoping for a rising tide to lift my ship too. But in my best moments, I, I'd like to think that this project is about really willing the best um, for my friends simply because I love them and I love their music. And I, I think that their music 
being more readily listened to would be a good thing for us, you know, as a people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a noble thing to give the world a gift like that. Yeah. we we'll try to. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. It's funny. The, the idea of the, the rising tide lifting all boats made me think of a thing that comes up in these conversations a lot, which is the, the definition of success, right? Because when you say, I want to write a successful song, you could mean I want to write a song that's going to make money, or you could mean I want to write a song that reaches someone and touches their soul or whatever. And so that comes up, that comes up a lot. And, um, and yeah, I guess when I think of the rising tide, like when I, when I posited that I was imagining that we're all trying to just make the world more beautiful. We're trying to give something to the world. So the, the tide that's rising is the happiness, the, yes. yeah. So, I mean, it would be great if we all could make enough money to put our kids through college, right? That'd be great. <laughs> I don't know. My kids are young. I don't even know if college is going to exist as a thing by the time I get my kids get there. I hope uh, it does. Uh, so I don't have to pay for it, but um, uh, yeah, I, no, I, I, I think I see better now um, what you're saying. Um, I think it says more about me that my mind I mean, <laughs> no. to, uh, to oh. economics, uh, but, but yeah, like that being the idea that uh, the more, um, uh, the idea that beauty will save the world, right? There, there's a lot, if, if you scroll Twitter and political Twitter for, for long enough, um, there's a lot of things to be gloomy about um, in the world. And I, from, a, from an almost like a spiritual standpoint, I, I genuinely believe that um, the world will be uh, uh, saved through beauty, that, that people will be attracted to what is sublimely beautiful and supremely beautiful ultimately more than they will be attracted to um uh, the more destructive parts of our nature which are you know fundamentally there we're, we're unable to get away from those things um uh, completely but but hopefully as artists we can make things that are so beautiful that it makes ourselves and the people around us want to uh choose the good uh, rather than frankly the the evil you know i hope you're right i think you're right I wonder the um, the stuff that we're up against um, externally as songwriters, as touring musicians, as artists is is pretty. I mean, that stuff's pretty obvious. And there's and it's a, there's a million conversations that we can have about how to how to deal with that, and they're useful, obviously. Um, but I wonder about the trickier stuff, maybe the um, the internally generated obstacles, the the stories that we tell ourselves to keep ourselves down. Um, I wonder if I'm assuming that you come up against them because I've never met an artist who doesn't, <clears throat> but I'm wondering what uh, you've come up with in, in terms of strategies for pushing through those over overcoming those obstacles. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, Cause obviously I have those strategies or I wouldn't still be here 15 years in, like you said, every artist comes up against them. So there's nobody um, who's been doing this for a long time that doesn't have that. I, I was joking around, I think it was with BJ on the phone a little while ago, which I kind of have this policy of if someone's made it in music or, or creative work for over 10 years, even if I'm not like a, a huge fan of their music, they immediately go into the category for me of people that I respect a lot. Like, so even it could literally be, and I don't mean to beat up on insane clown posse here. <laughs> I mean, like, let's just say I'm not going to be turning on an ICP record or going to Gathering of the Juggalos anytime soon. And yet, I mean, the fact that those guys have made it 30 years in the music business, hey, man, you know, there, there's something to that. And so um, I think the reason that I feel that way is because of exactly what you're talking about there, which is we all have to come up with these strategies to get past these internal uh, blockades. And if you can do that for over a decade, it's really impressive. So what are mine? You know, I think one of my my main ones is keeping music as just part of my life. It's my job. I love my job. Um, it's It will be when I die, hopefully many years from now, but it could be tomorrow. When I die, um, music and, and what I've created will be a part of some small legacy uh, that I leave behind. But... Um, much more important to me, and in fact, it's not even close, is my family, you know, um, my wife, my three kids, uh, my parents, my sister. Um, uh, that is what is genuinely important to me. So 
uh, when I get down to the dumps about music, um, as long as I'm, uh, you know, still making some dough and I can still pay the mortgage and I'm not worried about how I'm going to pay the mortgage six months to a year from now. And I don't feel like there's anything catastrophically wrong with the business end of it. I don't really worry about it too much, man. Like I really, I've let a lot of that go and I, uh, I can come up against failures, either external or internal on a daily basis and leave those in the studio or leave those in the green room when I leave the show and I sold, you know, uh, half as many tickets as I hope to sell, you know, um, I can, I can leave it behind because I have other things in my life. Not only do I have other things in my life, but the, the most important parts of my life reside elsewhere. So I'd say that that's, that's the main thing that keeps me going. Is that an evolution that you can track? Like when you were younger, were you impatient and, and freaking out about everything more than you are now? living and dying by it. Absolutely. In my twenties, absolutely living and dying by every ticket presale count, every album sold, every person who we pitched a record to at a label that didn't like it. Uh, every press outlet that, um, came back and said, it's not our thing. Like, yeah, I mean, living and dying by all of that. And not only was it a miserable existence, number one, but it also, that sort of worrying didn't add, didn't like increase my chances of succeeding with any of that stuff. Perhaps if it did, I would be fine going back and worrying about it all the time and, and making it more of a priority. But at a certain point I realized, you know, the worrying makes you feel like you're doing something, but it's not. And, and it's probably hindering you too. You know, that's what I've wondered. I've wondered if that kind of obsession, um, those that kind of fear and fear-based worry and the i wonder if that gets in your way uh, of being creative and i wonder also if it becomes something that repels other people like the like the the, the scent of desperation coming off of you drives people away not you not you but us no I, I know exactly what you're talking about there and i think <laughs> particularly that that second point i mean how could we even deny that that's true we, we all do that like as human beings we're instantly repulsed um, in social situations by people who, for lack of a better term, seem thirsty. I mean, we just are. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And when I say, you know, seem thirsty, you know, normally nine times out of 10, I'll be the guy uh, that you could label with that term. But the one time out of the 10 where I'm not that person and I see it coming from somebody else, like, I don't know what it is, man, but it's an unattractive quality. Um, and... Maybe it shouldn't be an unattractive quality. Maybe we should strive better as, as people to um, deal with that and, and uh, uh, give credit to people like that. But I, I just know that how we work as human beings. I mean, if you look in your own heart, how if someone, my wife calls it coming at somebody from an angle, like you can't come at them straight on. You got to come at them from an angle. And then if, if they don't want to buy what you're selling, just move on, you know? And um, we all know how unattractive it is when people come straight at you, not at an angle, and then they won't, they won't leave you alone. You know? <laughs> it's, I mean, every single day I've got to sort of check myself, but it's that um, save me, love me, God. But I wonder, I wonder, you know, something about what we do is, is built on that a little bit. Like we need people to love us. We need people to... Um, to buy what we're selling is maybe what you just said, but I, I guess how, how do you do that without it's like, it's, I guess you're walking a fine line, right? You are. And, and then to get away from it, it's so, it's so hard to get things right in life. Um, there's just, there's a million ways to do things wrong and like three ways to do things right. And so what I mean when I say that is if you move away from that kind of thirsty mode, as I put it there, if you move away from that, one way to get away from that is to put these huge blockades around you. Um, you know, these sort of defensive mechanisms where it's like, well, I don't care what anyone says about the new mixes or the new demo. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and it's like, well, yeah, yeah, it does matter to you. It, it does. And you can be, you can put up these defense mechanisms, um, all you want, but th that's not helping you either. Um, so how do you get to that place where you are fine with people taking what you do and you're fine with people leaving what you do? It's, it's, I don't know that that's a place that you can live in. I think that that's a place that you're always trying to 
um, calibrate yourself to. God, that I, I'm going to put that on my board. There's a million ways to do things wrong and three ways to do things right. That's a fantastic <laughs> t-shirt. I'm going to crochet that onto a throw pillow. No, uh, <laughs> all right. So if you were to run into a 21 year old version of yourself uh, living and working in today's world, what advice might you give yourself? This is going to sound so cliche and it's not useful at all to anybody who's in that position right now, but I would just uh, tell myself, enjoy it, man. Enjoy every single moment of this. I can remember, I think this happens to people a lot in their careers in, in music. Um, when your career starts, a lot of things happen for you really fast and you, and you get this natural momentum that's at the start of your career because you're a new you're a new thing then, and and people you get lots of opportunities then. Then as you as if you get a ticket to the dance after that, and you get to continue on, you still get different opportunities, but they don't come as fast as, as they first did. So when I was on that initial little ride, um, I wasn't able to enjoy it at all because I was always thinking about the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, and I also assumed that all these opportunities I was getting, I was like, cool, well, this is the first time I'm playing the Ryman. Cool. First time I'm playing Bonnaroo. First time I'm meeting, um, you know, uh, Steve Earle or somebody that I admire. And I just assumed that these would just be uh, things that I would now do on like an annual basis or something like that. You know what I mean? Very, um, very uh, presumptuous of me. Um, and it really got in the way of me actually enjoying those experiences of just like, oh, wow, man, I'm playing the Ryman right now. This might, you know, this will be, maybe I, I should play this like this will be the first and last time that I ever play here and soak it in and, and really enjoy it. And, and my life doesn't start, you know, 10 years from now. This is my life right now. There's nothing guaranteed um, past this. So enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it would be the only thing I would have told myself at 21. Oh, I love that. That speaks to me so hard today. That's really good. It's funny. I, I don't know if you do. You, are you aware, uh, familiar with the idea of morning pages? Julia yes. Cameron's The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, so I, I was writing my morning pages this morning and I was thinking about my kids going off to school. And in my son's case, it's it was his I, I can't I don't know if I can even say this without getting choked up. It was his last first day. Oh. And I was thinking about them and I was I was uh, um, writing about how fast it went you know the cliches and um and i was just wondering if i if i if i could go back what would i do again and it would just be that it would just be like just really appreciate it slow down those first days those and little that's the problem my little kids are a lot of work and they're hard and they can be annoying but um man when you hit the end it's just whoo yeah you're like i want to do that over again i know man <laughs> i i just I just did my first first day with my son. He just started. I, I'm in that position that you're talking about. And uh, uh, I'll tell you, I've, I've, uh, I've done a lot in the last year to really uh, redefine my relationship with, uh, frankly, alcohol. And uh... <sighs> man, I'm, I'm glad you're talking about this. I'm six years sober myself and I, and I'm, it's this is something people don't talk about so thank you for at least even just addressing it <laughs> yeah take your time man this is so uh, man being human is hard i think you said that a minute ago and i think it's so fucking true i've worked really uh hard in the last year to um address my relationship with alcohol and, and different substances that i you know, look, we were on the road, both of us, for a long time, all the time, and that stuff takes a bite out of you. And the reason that I'm bringing this up with talking about my son doing his first day and, and us trying to enjoy um, all these moments is, you know, it was the night before his first day, and he wanted me to rock him before he went to sleep. He never asked for that anymore, and I got to, like, I got to really enjoy that moment Whereas I'm not going to lie, like there's been some parts of parenting when I was in a different place where I'd be thinking, let me get these kids down so I can go crack a beer. You know what I mean? And, 
you, you miss stuff when you're when you're caught up um, in modes of that in your life. And and I'm not even saying that I'm completely out of that mode of my life. I, I think I'm going to be back and forth with getting caught up with bad stuff. But the point is, um, being in a place in my life where I was actually able to enjoy that moment uh, before he goes off to his first day. I mean, that to me, that is, that was a, 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 a spiritual experience to just be able to sit there for 15 minutes and it, and it uh, how do we calibrate our lives so that we're in moments like that as much as possible? You know what I mean? And I think as an artist, uh, that's what we're trying to do in our personal lives. And that's also what we're trying to do as we, uh, as we make our work. That's beautiful. And that's, that was, that's a success. You were there in that moment. You were there. Yeah. God, it's uh, the, my, we, um, we'll put on home movies sometimes on birthdays and stuff. When my kids were the age, your kids are now. And I was decidedly not sober. And there'll be a lot of times where the camera will cut to me and I'll be playing with one of the kids and, and I'll just wave her off. Like, don't film me. Cause I knew that I was stoned or I was drunk and here I'm like parenting and yeah. impaired imparenting. Yeah. That's the new, my new word. Im- imparenting. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty familiar with that one. That's <laughs> not the word, but the, the activity. <laughs> oh, um, all we can do is just is do our best and be here. And I really feel like, you know, they say, um, uh, you're, you're, you're living the examined life and that's, that's all you can do. Man, I'm really proud of you. You know, it's funny with the, you know, you're saying, well, you call it jokingly imparenting because you're kind of impaired and you're watching kids. It, it in certain ways, uh, parenting is kind of like touring in that it's so much like hurry up and wait. And I think a lot of, for me, drinking and, and substance uh, abuse or whatever it is, when I spent so much time on the road, it's just, it's something to do when you're on the road. It's culturally accepted. When you're watching super little kids that are under five, I mean, it's been a long day when you hit five o'clock and it's kind of fun to crack a beer or two at five with dinner. And then when they go down, you go down at eight or nine. You're like, well, I'm not hurting anybody. It's fine. Right. But it seems to me like it's just such a tough dragon to keep tamed and in its place. And if it was just, you know, "Ah, I crack a beer or two at at five o'clock. Well, sure. No harm, no foul. But the way that that stuff works is I, I don't think it tends to stay in the beer or two with dinner category at all. I think it tends to wander off pretty, pretty often, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. Not for me. And, and I think there are probably people who are really good at it. Um, in our profession, I think it probably tends a little towards um, eventually it either goes all the way one way or all the way the other way. Right. Yeah. That's what it does seem like. There, and, there's not too many, uh, there's not too many, you know, um, kind of middle of the career rockers who are able to just have the one glass of red wine after the gig and then repair back to the hotel. It's either, yeah, completely sober or uh, we're looking for blow in Indianapolis at uh, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> you know, so. Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter 
that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. Well, obviously, Rhett and I connected on a deep level about parenthood and the relationship that parenthood has to making art. You know, before I was a parent, I genuinely worried that its responsibilities would keep me from creating compelling art. With all the time that I would have to spend rearing and protecting my kids, how could I possibly devote the time necessary to create a beautiful song? It didn't take me long, though, to learn what all new parents learn immediately. That before I had kids, I was wasting a tremendous amount of time. And the new perspective that it gives you, being a dad or a mom, is worth far more to your creative voice than the time it takes away. Being so close to children can remind you of a more elemental, basic, and authentic existence. And there's a wonderful poem by Paul Murray about that phenomenon entitled, The Voice. Go back, if you can, to the beginning. That's what I heard the voice whisper. Your life, it's true, may not be glutted with conceit, but it is still full of small desires and small in its desire. Go back to the beginning. Return, if you can, to the place your father would take you when you were small, to the low-lying wall that faces out to the open sea. There, though at times your father might say little or nothing, always he was happy to let you babble on about your child's games and puzzles, talking and talking, until, that is, the moment came when you would both fall silent. What would happen then? Impossible to find the words even now to describe it. How, in the long silence that followed, such a wave of quiet would come over you, it was as if for the first time you were seeing and hearing all that lay before you. The utterly still, utterly calm grandeur of shore and mountain, sand and sea. What could you do then but hold your breath with wonder? You had no words, no thoughts to help explain what had occurred. You were too small for thoughts, but something changed all the same. A new, awakened desire, a surge of joy broke to the surface within you. What was it the voice whispered? Go back to the beginning. Return to the place you would go to as a child. It is late, but not too late. The past is still open. Even now, you may recover your first dream. Look, there is the shore and the sea and the mountain. You were standing next to your father beside the wall that faces the sea. He is a hand's breadth away. Thanks for appearing now on the Working Songwriter Podcast. We we flipped it just like that. Um, I wanted to talk. There's so many different eras of your career that I've wanted to talk about. The first one I think is kind of interesting. It has to do with specifically where you grew up. You grew up in the Dallas of the 1970s and 80s. And I think nowadays our national culture has become just that, like a more unified na- national culture because of the internet, but back then things were a bit more parochial, a bit more regional. So in my mind, you were still growing up in a city that was still very much haunted by like the Kennedy assassination, Mm -hmm. still sort of a one, not a one horse town, but a one industry town with with energy and and the boom of energy that happened in Texas in the, in the mid 20th century. Can you kind of speak to the cultural milieu that, that you grew up in? It's a really weird, specific cultural milieu. It was that um, I grew up with the vestiges of money, right? Like my grandfather was born into great wealth that his that his father made with a textile company. You know, his mother came from a long family of wealth. My my mother was actually from Arkansas, and they moved to Texas. But their family had been plantation owners 
which okay. is a which is a, a less horrifying way of saying what what they really were. Um, mm -hmm. All of the money by the time I was born had pretty much disappeared, but we lived on the outskirts of the really wealthy part of town. Um, yes, yeah, so in the seventies, it's fun to remember Roger Staubach, you know, captaining the Cowboys to Super Bowl victories, but but it was also um, it was also a kind of a dark time. Um, my grandmother had stood on um, on the, the the sidewalk in downtown Dallas one block before Kennedy was shot. Um, she was obsessed with him. When she died, I found uh, boxes of Kennedy memorabilia in her house, including right now in my office. I'm looking at an old jelly jar with a yellow rose and a note that said this yellow rose was from the table setting at the hotel banquet table um, where Kennedy was headed when he got shot. So wow. it's remarkably well preserved. Um, but, you know, it was the city of hate. So nationally, we were the laughing stock because of JR. Um, and we were sort of despised because there was probably some cabal of good old boys that had something to do sure. with, um, you know, I, I say that I do think for what it's worth, you didn't ask, but I do think Oswald acted alone. <laughs> um, but whoever knows, right? There, there, it was, there was definitely uh, an atmosphere in the 50s, 60s, 70s, in well into the 80s, even in the 90s. And, and it may persist to this day. I moved away from Dallas in the late 90s. Um, it was kind of a good place to be an artist, though, because I think you'll, you'll find that um, young people who want to make art probably the two best scenarios are a place like Austin where artists are revered and encouraged and subsidized or Canada or something, Canada. Uh, <laughs> or a place where artists are marginalized and downtrodden. And, and in a way that's great because it's, you know, us against them, you know, it's this really um, underdog mentality. And so I came up in that, you know, it was dangerous. There was a lot of skinheads around like racist skinheads i i got oh, wow. beat i got beat up as a you know 17 year old long-haired folk singer by a racist skinhead we, you know that was that was a big thing in dallas uh in in the punk rock scene and you know the, the rock and roll scene in the 80s um it was a weird place to grow up and i like to go back and visit because i got family there still and i do think there's really really great things about it um some great music still to this day coming coming out of dallas but, but yeah, man, it definitely informed some of the good things about my um, my work. But it it also it made it hard because I I never felt um, I never felt like what I was doing was you know the right thing or good or cool. Like it always felt like what I was doing was there was a shamefulness to it, right? Like I should be pursuing the almighty dollar. I should be in a fraternity. Um, yeah. And it's it, instead I was, well, you know, this weird free floating artist, just be believing I could improve the world one song at a time. So what, what did that music scene look like for you? I, I know you spent a few years at college and then you, you came back to Texas to form a couple different groups, which one of which would eventually of course become old 97s. What did that Petri dish of music look like that was the counterculture in, in Dallas? Boy, um, yeah, I, I did one semester at Sarah Lawrence College and had a full scholarship and bailed like an idiot. If my son did that now, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I know. Um, so Dallas at the time was all over the map, but I guess the late 80s, that's kind of how it was. You know, Edie and the New Bohemians were exploding and I used to open for them every Tuesday at the 500 Cafe. Um, Leroy Shakespeare and his Ship of Vibes were doing reggae. Uh, the Buck Pets had gotten signed to Island Records and they were doing like some proto version of that 90s grunge scene. Um, but one cool thing about this sort of schizophrenia of, of the music scene in Dallas, maybe everywhere, but certainly in Dallas at that time, was that me, uh, I was a teen folky, you know, I was 16, 17, 18 years old with a 12 string guitar 
playing folk songs and, you know, trying to shake this British accent because I listened to a lot of David Bowie, but they, they would book me opening up for um, Lords of the New Church and Chris Isaac and Frank Black on a solo tour on a break from the Pixies. And like I would, I remember opening for Red Cross at the punk rock club, the theater gallery, Red Cross being this LA uh, punk rock uh, pop power punk pop band that I was obsessed with still they still hold up their album neurotica i would recommend to anyone but yeah so that was a cool thing it was acceptable to be different from the other artists on the bill mm, mm. and it seems to me like once old 97s is born it's really interesting because at the very start with you guys coming out of that scene you kind of experienced music business record business 1.0 for a while you guys signed to Electra go on this wild ride what did the business itself look like at that time and, and how did it look different than things look now oh my god joe that's i mean okay so our 14 year age difference you the thing you missed was the grossest thing about it and it, <laughs> um because there was such an element of brass ring clutching you know there was there was a brass ring there was you know there was a, a boardroom full of old white guys that would decide who was going to have the next giant record um you know their lackeys the a and r guys would go sniff around in local scenes and you would do anything to get near an a and r guy a um the south by southwests of the late 80s and early 90s were really gross you know i remember i had this crush on this one girl uh, at south by and she and i'd gone on a date we wound up in a four seasons hotel room smoking a big fat doobie with all these record label people and i looked around and she had disappeared and there was just some old um i remember exactly who it was though i'm not going to say it some <laughs> old, some old a and r guy that former like um you know, punk band member, A&R guy, and she had disappeared to his hotel room with him. I mean, the the power that these gatekeepers had was so absolute. And so we all were desperate for their attention, for their love, for their validation, for their money. Um, and it was gross. And, and when eventually the record industry collapsed entirely, and as it was collapsing, I was there for the ride. You know, we did have a few records with giant budgets, I made multiple records with quarter million dollar budgets. That's so stupid. <laughs> but I remember thinking like, well, yeah, duh, of course. This is not the way it should have ever been done. It should always have been some sort of a farm system with, you know, sub pops and blood shots, you know, right. building up artists, artists developing their um, their voice over years on the road, developing their audience over years on the road, eventually taking the step up if merit dictated. But it wasn't that. It was like, oh man, I got this, you know, this next thing that, and I'm going to look like a genius. And um, there was some element of meritocracy to it, but the randomness was probably 90% to the 10% meritocracy. It was gross. And um, I guess I was one of the winners of the of the lottery back then um but i never felt great about that element <laughs> of it so you're basically saying that rob Lowe as the anr guy in wayne's world was not too far off the mark uh, yeah no, i mean that said there were also good anr guys and it's yeah. funny even in our in our experience with electra records like we had 14 different record labels um vying for the opportunity to sign us to their deal which of course it's so funny to think that the brass ring was signing an incredibly lopsided contract right, right. like some rapacious contract <laughs> like yeah serious, man but we we at electric records we had two a and r guys that signed us and one is still one of my very very best friends in the world and mm -hmm. one of them ended up having an ep of songs written about him by Britt daniels sort of excoriating him for mm -hmm. his robolo ness as it okay. were uh, now what, you know, when you have an album that has a budget like that for it to be made of a quarter million dollars and you have basically a large multinational corporation with, with an interest in, in not only recouping that budget, but, but making it into much, much more, how does that play out on like the, on the day-to-day -day level of how a record is like composed, recorded, made, the decisions go into it? Like, 
what did the process look like and, and how is it different than making a record now for more uh, indie labels, which you've been on for, with your own record label, which you are now the proprietor of? Um, how did that how did that manifest itself in the work? When so I'm sure everyone's experience is different. We got lucky and that that one A&R guy that I'm still super close with, Tom DeSavia, is one of my best friends. Um, and we still work on a lot of things together. Tom did a great job of uh, acting as a buffer and and also sort of working the label. There were enough people within the label that that loved us and championed us. So our first record um, for Electra, we didn't know anything except, oh my God, we have money. Look at all these rolls of physical, you know, tape that we're going to get to record on. We're filling them up and oh, I have all this time. Instead of three days, we have like, you know, three weeks. And so we never thought, oh man, we need to sound like our label mates third eye blind. Right. The, the second record, um, there was suddenly an awareness. Now we'd, we'd now done enough meetings in boardrooms and we'd now seen the sort of disappointment on the faces of the different um, uh, project managers and different people at the label where they wanted third eye blind. They, they, you know, for them to have a critically acclaimed um, very low selling alt country act at that point, we, all we were, doing for the label was we were somebody they could point to when they were signing bands and say, no, look, we're, we're letting bands have careers. No, look, uh -huh. we're, we're signing bands that are outside of the mainstream. Uh, just look at these poor guys. You know, we, we didn't drop them. We could have dropped them. Anybody else would have dropped them, but we didn't. So, but we did use that to our advantage by, you know, and then also when we made our second record, it was a little more in my brain that we needed to try and um, make music that was less easy to pigeonhole. But at the same time, I didn't feel like that was a gross move on my part because I was frankly sick of being pigeonholed. You know, the, the, alter the alternative country and cow punk seemed incredibly reductive to me. So the idea of making music that was more reflective of the wide range of music that I actually listened to, be it Bell and Sebastian or Sebado or you know, whatever, like th those, those weren't my two like main bands. They're just two that popped to mind that represent a, a spectrum of music. So I wanted to do that as well. I wanted to make um, more interesting music that didn't, that was less easy to categorize. What I didn't want to do was try and come up with an algorithm of music that would sell and then cater to that. So I, I never did that. And, I, and, you know, Maybe it would never have even worked because we were called oh, yeah. old. Oh, no. Uh, we're back. I, I lost you. at You weren't trying to make an algorithm of music. <laughs> I was talking too fast. No, you're <laughs> um, I, I don't know that that even would have worked because we already were saddled with the band name Old 97s, which is like the least marketable band name of all time. So, yeah, you know, all it is is just one one foot uh, in front of the next and try to figure out each, you know, one record after another. And I'm glad I never really came up with the algorithm um, right. because it would have felt gross. And even if we'd have had a hit, then what, where would I be now on a tour of bands reprising their nineties hit a nostalgia yeah, um, act? That's exactly. Yeah. That, that is the answer to that question. That is what you would be. Right now. <laughs> you know, you, you were talking about wanting to, um, bring in all those different influences of, of yours that, you know, maybe weren't getting recognized at first with that band. It makes me think of one of my very favorite periods of your career is when you go out and um, you're going to make some of your first solo records and where you land, it's so interesting. You and you land in Los Angeles with John Bryan to make, um, you definitely made the instigator with him. Did you make more records with him or was it just the instigator? He played uh, a bunch on the following record, but didn't produce it. The George Shukulius produced The Believer. Right. So you end up, it's not like you, you know, you stayed in um, uh, uh, Texas to, to make this type of stuff. To me, it's always seemed like you go and seek out, that was such a scene out there with John Bryan um, at that time. And it was, was Largo going on at that point? Oh, yeah. So like that, and it was like around Largo. I feel like there was a lot of um, kind of alternative comedians um, uh, coalescing around that scene right there. So I guess what I'm interested in is number one, how the hell did you end up in that 
um, that vortex? And number two, um, what was it like being there on the ground as an artist? God, I got so lucky at that time to wind up in that scene because it was so nurturing. It really still is. Largo has moved to a bigger space and has evolved into a different thing, but it's still, the heart of it is still there. And it's this really nurturing community of um, now mostly comedians. At the time, it was a little more half and half, maybe even aired on the side of musicians, but it was you know, like the elder statesmen, like Colin Hay and Neil Finn. It was um, younger folks like Fiona Apple and um, boy, Elliot was, Elliot Smith was a little older than me, but getting to sit on stage with him, ne sit, sit next to him and watch, and just to be like one foot away from him on a song swap after backstage, he and Fiona had both been, nobody's gonna, had been saying, nobody's gonna like us. We're so terrible. And I'm looking at them going, are you crazy? And um so yeah, it was so inspiring. It, it, the thing happens where you, you sit in the room with someone who's that brilliant and you think, oh my God, I what am I doing? I can't keep up with this. But then that in itself is its own lesson. You have to learn to overcome that. What I'm doing is different from what they're doing. I could never do what they're doing as well as them, but I can do what I'm doing even better. Right. So it was really beautiful. And the comedians... Um, Watching the the fearlessness with which you know Paul Tompkins or Karen Kilgariff or um, Mark Maron getting punched out by a guy in the front row, watching these people um, night after night after night, and it would be like a comedian opening for me. You know, I would I would get you know Zach Galifianakis on stage uh, before I would do my show, and Zach would be doing things that were so shocking, and he would be making them up on the spot, and. Um, like that, that's super inspiring. And you, you know, you talk about what you do and what Todd Snyder does and what I do, and we all do it very differently, but it is, there's a requisite bravery to the idea of walking out on a stage with no safety net. And sure, we have our songs, comedians, I guess they have their bits, but we're still walking out on stage and, and we could fly or we could flop on any given night. And it's terrifying. And that's part of what makes it so fun, I think, certainly for us, but I think also for the audience. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely either one of those things, being a comedian or a musician playing live, it is a very much what have you done for me lately type of um, experience. Even if you're like a known commodity and the audience loves you and you come out, they, you know, they know what you're up to, like you still have to deliver that night. You'll get about five minutes of people kind of nervous laughter and, and you know, uh, giving you something, but if you don't give them anything, um, it turns dark real quick, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because we're asking them to empathize. And if what they end up having to empathize with is insecurity, like that's, that's not great. That's no. hard. No, no, no. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the conversation for uh, the wheels off interview of like that idea of it's, it's just very unattractive to, to have sort of that sort of thirstiness uh, mm -hmm. about you. Uh, even on stage, maybe that's the worst place for it. It's like the whiff of despair. Ugh. <laughs> That'll be the name of my autobiography. <laughs> the whiff of desperation. Whiff of desperation. Uh, how did your your writing style um, must have been must have been changed by going through that scene? Because you know you're you're in the scene that you you grew up in, and now you go to a place where. Uh, uh, this scene is just filled with world-class artists of every discipline. Like how did your own creative practice change at that point being in that um, cultural moment? Man, I think, I think I had enough hubris to, to believe that I belonged, which thank God, thank God, because it would have been very, really easy to just get shut down um, instead of thinking, Oh, they did that. Well, I could do this, you know, like I'm, I'm going to show up too. It's not a competition, but you always want to prove that you belong. Right. Like, yes. and there's an element of hunger. Like I, I was, I've always felt into this day, like literally this morning, I woke up thinking about the song I wanted to write and thinking that I needed it to be better than these other two songs I'd written or better than someone else's songs. Like that, that, that feeling of being hungry has never gone away for me. And I, I hope it never does. I, I hope it never becomes something grosser or again, you know, more desperate, but, but it's been, um, it's been really useful for me. So in, in those days, you know, I, I learned 
I think it's it's about what you're rewarded for. So in the early days of the old 97s, we would go to uh, little clubs and we'd be on bills with other bands that were what we now call Rootsy, but at the time had all these really stupid names, Honky Skronk or whatever. Um, <laughs> and the thing for which I was rewarded during those early days was, you know, how much can I, um, how much can I tickle their corn pone fancy? You know, like uh, we're, I'm a seventh generation Texan, right? Like I, I feel like I have every right to get up on stage and do a little bit of yeehaw, but right. you know, at a certain point, I just feel like I'm doing some, some dance that that no longer feels appropriate so when i moved out to la it was it was really nice to like feel the freedom of oh my god okay i don't have to put on the overalls not that i ever technically literally wore overalls the metaphorical overalls yes i get to take off the metaphorical overalls and i get to um you know really do uh, the broad range of things that interested me and that was suddenly something that i was being rewarded for oh you like pop music um you like you know like that power pop music that John Bryan loved so much. Well, he'll sit right next to you on stage and play piano while you just power through these power pop songs and boom, that's like the greatest feeling you've ever experienced. I feel like that is still a path that you, that seems like a straight line between where you were then and where you are right now. I feel like that, that is a book that you're continuing to write here for the last couple decades. Do you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the, this morning that, the idea for a song I had, I don't, who knows if I'll finish it or not, but it was a, a song called Birds of New York. And it was, you know, it's this kind of rootsy sounding thing that hopefully will explode into like a big chorus that, you know, is not something that would have come out of Hank Williams Sr., but maybe the verse sounds like something that did. And maybe it's that marriage of um, the the sacred and the profane, you know, the, um, the old timey and the, uh, the sixties, you know, the, the mid-century modern, like that's something that's always appealed to me. You, um, as much or, or more than most, I, I would be in this category with you too. As soon as the pandemic began, you leaned into live streaming, um, big time. I know I did. I know Hayes Carl did Todd Snyder, there's a fair amount of people who uh, were kind of troubadours, for lack of a better word, who immediately didn't wait, just pivoted immediately to live streaming. So I guess my question is, like, what made you use that approach rather than another way to keep your business going? And also, how do you think it's going to change? Um, how has it changed your uh, artistic process or in, in how you connect with your listeners at this point? Um, I imagine that your experience was similar to mine and tell me if, if, it, if it differed in, in any large way, but I think it's two things. Um, what we do, uh, songs and storytelling is so built for this medium. Like I'm sitting right now where I sit when I do my streams, it's where I sit when I write songs, like it's the difference between the genesis of a song and the dissemination of that song is not that giant. Like, okay, now I finished it. Now I can feed it into this HD camera here and this, uh, this beautiful Apogee condenser microphone. And now they have it. Um, so we are, or I'll only speak for myself. I felt very lucky that my, uh, product, whatever it is that I do, um, lends itself to this medium. Also, um, you know, to the question of why so quickly and how did I land here? Terror, just sheer abject terror. I've got two teenagers. I don't have a savings account. What the hell am I going to do? So this is it. And, and what does the future hold for it? I've learned that I can do it. I've learned that I like it. And I think certain folks in the audience have learned that it works for them to attend a show like that, to, to come together in a community like that, whether it's the chat room or just the feeling of me and them together in a room. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to go away. I think there will be some uh, portion of my career that is, that is this, you know, that is uh, live streaming probably for the rest of my life. And I think it's great. I get to put, like you're saying, I get to put my kids to bed. I get to wake up with them on the 
I'm almost always gone the first day of school because summer, I take a lot of time off during the summer. Right. And then when September rolls around, I'm like, guys, I'm sorry, I can't stay home anymore. I got to go. And now I'm on the West Coast. Sorry. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's uh, that's a real thing. I don't know how much you've been back. Um, I've been back playing um, in real life shows a little bit this summer. And I have already, I feel a difference between audience members during shows and after shows. Um with their level of um, familiarity um, with me, with their, uh, they feel a real ownership of what's going on in a way that they didn't used to. They feel like closer to this. And um, I think it has to do 100% with the medium of, they feel like I've been giving them a fireside chat once a week for 60 weeks. You know what I mean? So it's, um, this is never going to be the only thing, but it's certainly, yeah, I, I don't see it going away. I talked to Hayes Carl on the phone uh, a month ago because he was wrapping his up because he's heading back on the road a bunch. And he was like, man, he was like, Joe, you should you should quit it now, man. He was like, look, you don't want to be the last guy at the party. Hayes <laughs> put it up. It's like, you know, Hayes, I've been the last guy at the party pretty drunk every time for my whole life. So why why change it here? Um, b- before I let you go, I just got to let you know, I don't know that there's a question here. It, it's more just a statement of gratitude from me. But when I first opened for you uh, 10 or 12 years ago, you were the first like national headlining artist that I ever got to open for. And I was still working a job construction and stuff like that at the time. And then after that, I think you uh, ended up maybe saying a a word of encouragement to your agent or maybe your manager about me. And then I ended up on the road with Steve Earl after that. So basically what I'm just saying is I feel like the trip that I'm on, I tell folks all the time uh, that the trip that I'm on, it, it I can draw a line right back to you and, and how grateful I am for, for you. I mean, you really uh, opening those shows and you putting in a good word for me, like really changed my life, man. So, oh thank- my God, that's so sweet. You, I wouldn't have said it or done it if I didn't 100% believe that you have always been the real deal. Um, but God, that that's so beautiful because it's funny. Like you go through this, this, I, w- I won't say you go through this dumb life. I, I, my kids are telling me I need to stop like uh, saying things like that. This, you go through this beautiful, but too fast life and it doesn't seem like it makes sense. And then, and then. Every once in a while, you see how um, moments in your life from the past have ripple effects in your future. And you see how human beings um, can interact in ways that really wind up being like manifestations of love that reverberate over time and space. And I'm, I, I will never take any credit for what you've done, but I really think that... Um, I really just, I feel so, so proud of you and what you've done. And I'm really grateful um, to be able to just kind of share this, this community, however big it is with you. And thank you. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Rhett Miller's podcast is entitled Wheels Off. You can find it in the iTunes store. I highly recommend it. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, Please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.